Signal processing is a subject that may seem boring at first glance, but turns out to be fascinating once you get to grips with it. In this video, I am going to present one of its many applications that I find almost magical, probably because I'm too bad at math. First, let's go back to basics. A mathematical function is a set of operations on one or more input numbers that transforms them into one or more output numbers. An extremely simple function is, for example, one that returns a constant for any input number. In general, it is easy to draw a straight line with a linear equation. We've seen how to draw a straight line, but what equation could result in a circle? To do this, we're going to use a slightly different type of function. Instead of having y defined as a function of x, both coordinates are now functions of a parameter that we'll call t here. Our circle can therefore be defined as xt equal cos t and yt equal sin t. This function category provides the flexibility to create a variety of shapes. But what would be the parametric function of any drawing? How could we go about defining it? For example, what would be the equation of this drawing? Or this one? First, let's consider a simpler example. The drawing is defined by a set of points corresponding to different mouse positions over time. This set of time-varying points can be considered a signal, and we can therefore apply a Fourier transform to it. More specifically, as the signal is made up of discrete values, we use the DFT, discrete Fourier transform. This transform decomposes a periodic signal made of equally spaced samples into a sum of signs. This operation may seem complicated, but let's walk through it step by step. Here's the formula we'll need to implement. Let's take it apart to understand it better. This first term corresponds to the coefficient of rank k to be calculated. This coefficient is equal to a sum that covers all samples of our input signal of size n. This is simply the sample at position small n. This last term is a little frightening, but it's actually quite simple. It describes a periodic signal that oscillates k times in one period of our input signal. This part remains constant throughout the loop and represents the frequency of this signal. And we then multiply by the current sample index. To simplify the formula, we could rewrite it as follows. This equation uses the exponential form of complex numbers. But to be able to implement it, let's write it in a way that separates the real and imaginary parts. We can write our formula like this. To sum up, our coefficient of index k is equal to the sum of the multiplication of our original signal with another signal of frequency k. Let's turn this into code. This implementation relies on the complex class natively provided by the C++ standard library. Now that we have a function for calculating the coefficients, we need to tackle a little DFT subtlety. The formula we've used multiplies our input signal with signals of frequencies ranging from 0 to n-1. Let's see what these signals actually look like with a simple example. 
What's interesting to note is that the very high frequencies are strangely similar to the low ones. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the two. You can see that the two signals are identical, but with opposite signs. It turns out that this is due to aliasing. I won't go into detail here, as this is a little out of my area of expertise. The consequence of this phenomenon is that if we want to reconstruct our signal with sine waves of increasing frequency, we have to generate the negative frequencies as well. So here's how I'm going to generate the coefficients in my code. Each time this function is called, it generates a new coefficient. To alternate between negative and positive values, simply take the opposite of the previous coefficient. If it was negative, we add 1 to move on to the next pair of values. Now let's see how we can reconstruct our signal using the coefficients. First, we'll focus on just one of our signal's coordinates. Let's start with y. The approach will be exactly the same for x. Here's the code to create the y-axis signal. Here's the formula for the inverse transform. As we did earlier, let's take it apart and try to understand it. What this formula allows us to calculate is the sample at position n of the reconstructed signal. To obtain its value, we sum all the previously calculated coefficients multiplied by a signal of frequency k, in the same way as we did for the transform. Then divide by the number of samples to normalize the result. This formula can be written as follow to better match the way it will be expressed in code. Let's apply this to our signal for y. We'll immediately normalize the coefficients to make them easier to represent. They can then be represented as disks with the radius and angle defined by their norms and arguments. Then, multiplying each coefficient by a complex of norm 1 is equivalent to applying a rotation to it, the angular velocity being proportional to the argument. Finally, we sum all the coefficients together. And here's the result when we reapply the rotation with the sum. Let's plot the evolution of the sum over time to better compare it with our target signal. Although rather crude, we can see that, with 9 coefficients, we are already getting a pretty good approximation for y. With 40 coefficients, the result is already much better. I've also taken advantage of the fact that the order in which the values are added doesn't change the result of the sum to sort the coefficients by descending norm for greater readability. Now let's apply the exact same process to the signal for x. Unfortunately, we have a problem. At the boundaries, the reconstruction is totally failing and doesn't match our signal at all. The reason lies in the definition of the transform, which applies to periodic signals. Our signal for x has a strong discontinuity between its two ends. This introduces a large jump in values leading to strong oscillations. Fortunately, we can cheat a little. We can simply force our signal to be periodic by closing the loop. To do this, we will just add padding points so that the two ends are equal. These points are shown in green here. The reconstruction is now much more accurate, but there's another problem. The padding points have been incorporated into the result, which isn't great. Here again, we can twist things to our advantage. These points are easy to identify. As all the samples are spaced by the same amount of time, we can deduce when the reconstruction is in the padding zone. In this case, we simply omit the points when drawing. Here's the pseudocode for a function that determines whether we're in the padding zone. 
Here's what happens when we use this function to determine whether or not to draw the reconstruction. It's not perfect, but we can always improve the result with more coefficients. Here I am using 80 coefficients. We now have everything we need to reproduce our drawing. By combining the two signals, we can effectively reconstruct the input geometry. Even with a basic understanding of the inner workings of this transform, I find it incredible that it works so well. We now have a way of reproducing our simple example. But what about a more complex drawing? made up of several separate strokes, like this one. To handle this more generic case, we'll need to modify the way we store our signal. In addition to the value of each sample, we'll also store a boolean, which will be used to determine whether a sample should be drawn or not. Generating the signal is then very simple. Just store the mouse position in addition to the click state. Samples for which the click is active are in orange and those for which it is not are in white. Padding samples are shown in green. We now need a function that tells us whether the reconstructed sample should be drawn or not. Once again, it's very simple. We can use a generalization of the function we wrote to detect padding. And finally, we have everything we need to build a mathematical machine to reproduce any drawing. So far, we've broken down our signal into two sub-signals, one for each coordinate. But in reality, it's perfectly possible to calculate the transform of both at the same time. All we need to do is give the DFT the signal as it is. The result is a unique sum of coefficients. I know I've said this before, but I'm always amazed that it works so well. It's another thing I could watch for hours. I hope these brief explanations aren't too incomprehensible. I'm well aware that my approach to this subject is that of a developer, not a mathematician. <laughs>